Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm General Manager for the Open Source Security Foundation at the Linux Foundation. I'm also uh, somebody who's been involved with the Apache community since the very beginning. Uh, I was a co-founder of the Apache Web Server Project uh, and uh, a founding member of the Apache Software Foundation and its president for the first three years. And so it's particularly an honor to be able to address you today and to be able to talk on this subject. I'm also not only really committed, obviously, to helping figure out how projects like like Apache can be more secure in the software it releases and 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 consumes and builds upon, um, but also to help grow the uh, open source community there in China uh, and in the greater Asia Pacific region, and to help uh, developers there feel like first class participants in the global open source community. Uh, Apache has been very successful in China. There are a lot of Chinese contributors to Apache projects, so uh, I think you guys have figured something out out about how to facilitate that that um, a lot of the rest of the world needs to learn about. But at the same time, I think we all have a shared interest in making open source much more secure than it is today. So I'm going to, to start with uh, sharing my deck here. Um, uh, and I, I, yeah, wanted to walk you through some of the, the th ways that I view where we've gone perhaps a bit wrong with open, with security in the open source world uh, and some of what we're trying to do to fix that through the open SSF and then end it with a call to all of you to think about ways that you might adopt some of these practices in your own Apache projects or other open source projects. So I wanted to start with a rather fun uh, screenshot from a website that uh, is still around. Uh, this is actually an archived screenshot of this from 1995. This is a website called Netcraft, a company called Netcraft, that actually every uh, month, uh, starting from 1995 forward, would do a survey of the different websites running out there uh, uh, and ask e e every single website it could find, every IP address, every host name, what web server software are you running? And the web server software in the HTTP header response would, would tell you Apache or or uh, Netscape or Microsoft or the original NCSA server or whatever else it was running, right? Um, and it was this very data-driven every month kind of way to visualize a graphic that is sadly broken here in this archive version, but which would show you the rise of the Apache web server and then the hold that it had at 50, 60 percent-ish for, for decades, right? For a very long time. Uh, and uh, it was really like the first time I think that we in the open source community uh, had a way of demonstrating to people that it was actually being used, you know, that it was running. Because uh, up until that point, open source software was not showing up in any market data. There were no purchase orders for open source because it was all free. No one knew how much of it was running out there. So being able to measure the spread of open source software came became a key part of convincing the boss that it could be trusted, right? Because we had this, there were a whole lot of questions. If this software is written for free and given away for free, what's the catch? It must not be very good, right? Um, compared especially to the commercial proprietary software you could build. But that site showed you not only are the majority of people running websites, running Apache and presumably other open source software behind it, you could also see specifically which organizations are running it. And everybody from the Vatican, you know, the, the, the seat of uh, Christianity to the CIA and other US government agencies and obviously corporations around the world were running this. And if it's good enough for them, it should be good enough for us. Um, so this is great for adoption, great for legitimacy for open source. But it's an argument that also led us into this dark path, I think, which uh, had us implying that popularity is equal to security. That basically because software, open source software is widely used, then it probably is more secure. And I think, it's, I think it is probably more secure, but the question is, is it secure enough? Is something for us to think about. Um, but that was really the first step in helping people come to trust open source code was that they could see it running everywhere. The second step towards really building trust out there was showing it didn't depend upon heroics or personality. Uh, I, you know, really Apache, Linux, Perl, all of these uh, open source projects and, and institutions really developed contribution and project acceptance processes that favored community over code. Now, community over code has long been part of the Apache DNA, um, long been something that we've we've highlighted as an important thing about in, uh, about building software. In fact, if you apply to have your project hosted at Apache, it almost doesn't matter what it does. It does, almost doesn't matter if objectively the software is high quality, you know, it doesn't have to be the fastest or the most featureful. It does have to have a community. 
And it does have to follow uh, the Apache way, which over time has been better and better documented, but basically it comes down to you have to build software as a community. And now this is a picture of what was called a barn raising, what is called a barn raising uh, that uh, perhaps was more popular back in like the six, you know, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. Um, but there's still communities that practice this today uh, where the village gets together when a farmer wants to build a barn and uh, works together as an entire village in a one day or in a weekend to do all the heavy lifting and, and standing up and all the processes that are really hard about building a barn. Something that even one person, even if they worked 100 years, would never be able to do on their own, right? So before machinery, heavy machinery, before manufacturing of, of these kinds of things, this was the way that people used to build barns. Uh, uh, and frankly, a lot of software feels to me like a barn raising, feels to me like a group of people getting together, a lot of open source software at least, a group of people with different skills, with different agendas, different priorities, different backgrounds even, um, uh, coming together to build something bigger than any one of them could build on their own, even if they had all the time in the world. Uh, and um, this to me is a pretty important way to, to think about how Apache works and Apache Software Foundations work, or Apache Software Foundation projects work. Um, and it's key not only to the quality of the code, but I also think to the security of that code as well. Uh, there's a group called Chaos, C-H-O, C-H-A-O-S-S, who's, who look at community health in open source projects uh, and try to measure that uh, and try to do a lot of the same things that we do within Apache to try to see if projects are healthy and built by built by communities of people. Um, but a lot of the open source industry, a lot of the rest of the open source community went in a different direction. And, and this felt like it started about 10 years ago with the rise of you know, JavaScript for backend uh, purposes and, and, and um, other languages and tooling environments that rather than thinking about software the size of say the, the Apache web server, you know, a couple hundred thousand lines of code, something that is managed by, you know, 10-ish core maintainers where there's a healthy turnover, sometimes in individuals. Instead it was, here's the hundred million projects on GitHub. And uh, in certain ecosystems like the NPM or Node.js ecosystem, you had tools that favored lots and lots of tiny modules, say 100 lines of code that did a very specific thing, but which unfortunately meant they were built by one person, right, by one developer uh, who sometimes would burn out, sometimes never found other developers to help them. Um, uh, sometimes that code would duplicate other code, but all the kinds of things that I know a pro Apache projects do to be more secure, it's really hard to do when you're just one developer, even if it's just 100 lines of code. And then you get resentful. Where are all the other people? There's millions of people using my code, but I'm the one building it, and it creates this rather unfortunate dynamic. And I showed this picture here. This is a flea market. This is a just a gigantic uh, kind of marketplace to try to illustrate that so many people think open source software is about that. The one developer, you know, projects that are engaging with the public and, and selling, you know, and people are using it and, and maybe contributing the occasional patch, but very dependent on 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 heroics on one person. And I think that's wrong. I think we really should think about doing something other than that. Instead, I think we should think about how to have more of these barn raising kinds of communities um, uh, and and how to actually have them build upon each other the way that we build software today with tons of dependencies. With apologies to turtles, you perhaps heard the, the phrase, it's turtles all the way down. I really think we should be thinking about uh, uh, how do we make this barn raisings all the way down? How do we think about security in that context as well? Really asking whether the the not just the operating system we build on top of or the framework, but even the when we pull a, a small component off of GitHub or off of any other resource, how do we have confidence in it that not only it does what it says it'll do, but that it's likely to be more secure? And so the open source community, software community really was one of the first places on the internet that demonstrated with the right processes, you could handle contributions from anonymous and pseudonymous sources. This is key to scaling, uh, to being able to say with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, right? Uh, which was what Eric Raymond called Linus Torvalds's law, although he never said it. Um, but it's still important to think about how do you make sure you have enough people and enough process to tend, trend towards not only better quality code, but more secure code. 
And I'll note that Apache and then these open source, other open source projects where you can be anonymous, come in and contribute, are some of the last such places on the on the open internet. Um, and these processes work. There is a um, uh, you know, there's lots of we we've tend to focus on vulnerabilities and and bugs that have become bad, like log for shell. But let's talk about a success story. Um, last year, the University of Minnesota uh, attempted as a research project without telling anybody that they would uh, see if they could submit a backdoor into the Linux kernel. And they worked really, really hard to come up with a, a patch that not only implemented something useful, right? That's the way those patches get accepted, uh, but also did a very hidden, uh, 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 built in a very hidden compromise. Uh, and yet it got, it, it, it made its way into the process. Uh, it was accepted a few steps in and then I believe it was caught by Greg Crowhartman or one of the lieutenants and basically said this, there's something fishy about this. They started to talk with other maintainers about it and then they went back and, and told the submitter, sorry, there's, there's a very explicit uh, hole in this. Who are you people? Um, they explained and from that point forward, the University of Minnesota has now been banned from contributing to the Linux project because of this uh, intentional attempt to compromise the system. Now that was caught. Obviously, we don't know about the ones that haven't been caught. But the evidence does suggest that well-run projects are able to catch and mitigate, uh, the, you know, uh, intentional submissions of problems. Now, not all the time, as we know, there's been a lot of uh, compromises that have had to do with compromising dependencies, compromising build systems, like the Solar Winds hack, for example, is really more about a compromised uh, CI/CD infrastructure. Um, but at least when it comes to upstream code, if you have healthy processes, uh, then then you have a chance at addressing this. Now. What would it take to actually make these processes better? Let me just state some general generalities, and then I'll go into specifics. Uh, I think we need better tools to measure the trustworthiness of code based on objective measures. And I'll show some examples of that when we get into it, of uh, ways that you can evaluate the code and the community around that code uh, uh, numerically and, and ask for an apples to apples comparison. Um, we need processes that encourage better security practices by developers. like. You know, there's all sorts of training out there uh, for uh, developers to take to, to write more defensive code. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of um, things that Apache projects are required to do um, by the security team that tend towards better, but other things they could do um, that would that would do it. And how do we how do we uh, how do we encourage them to do that? Um, we also need tools and processes that encourage teamwork and more shared responsibility for security, which speaks to all the stuff that I just mentioned. Um, and then finally, we need to add by default to all of the above, because to whatever degree we have programs that require developers to go out of their way to um, take on a, an additional burden or additional amount of work without any clear you know, benefit from that other than, well, maybe it's more secure that's going to be really hard to do. So what we need to do is figure out how to wire this stuff into the, the IDEs, the build tools, the, the, the repository systems and, and all that. So at the OpenSSF, we, uh, uh, for the last few years, have been setting up working groups and uh, initiatives and projects within those working groups focused on a pretty wide array of different activities that we think will have an impact on exactly those kinds of, of things. Um, and I'll walk through them uh, kind of briefly. There's obviously a lot more information available at the OpenSSF website I, I, and, and more. Um, but I, I, the, the working, there's seven different working groups. Uh, uh, the first uh, that I'll talk about is the best practices working group. Um, best practices is focused on uh, I, for example, there's a soft, secure software development fundamentals courses that have been developed uh, and pushed out onto edX and pushed out to uh, the Linux Foundation training portal that represent about 20, 30 hours of training that can make any software developer uh, more aware of how the code they're writing could be compromised, right? To kind of avoid some common pitfalls, um, uh, avoid avoid some uh, easy things to, to exploit, to avoid things like security by obscurity, but also to, to, to you know, think about general things. So for example, one of the recommendations uh, in, in this courseware is you know, user input can be very dangerous and you don't wanna trust it. You don't wanna have to, to, to you know, have a hole that if somebody sends you certain surprising input would be triggered, right? And in particular, one thing that's dangerous to do is parse that user contributed input for format strings, right? Things you would send to a printf. Well, that recommendation is exactly what triggered the, the Jindy LDAP bug in log4j, 
Uh, and um, uh, and so it's those kinds of patterns that there's actually not an you know an infinite number of these. We can train against it. We can we can learn more about how to how to how to avoid those. We also have uh, uh, something called the the open source best open SSF best practices badge, which is a questionnaire for maintainers of projects to fill out about their project. Which answers such questions as, do you have a security team and a, and a public email address to report security holes? Do you have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process? Do you require multi-factor auth uh, uh, you know, for your core maintainers? I mean, all these kinds of things that are really just belt and suspenders. And then we have a website that shows here's the scores that people have achieved. And if you and if you pass, uh, well, actually, whatever level of passing you're at, because it's graded, you know, you could be 50% passing, you know, 90%, 100% or 10%, you can show a badge on your website of how far or much progress you've made. Um, and the idea is there, that's one of those signals that helps developers understand this code, even if it's uh, perhaps less featureful than this other project, it might be more secure, right? We also have uh, uh, done things like distribute multi-factor auth tokens out to over a thousand different developers out there. Um, uh, there's another project under best practices working group focusing on automated tooling for being able to scan a project and see if they use certain practices. And that's uh, something called scorecards. Um, so all sorts of different initiatives that are about trying to figure out how do you promote the adoption of best practices and actually try to measure whether those are being followed. We have another working group focused on vulnerability disclosures, and the big release out of that is a uh, guide to coordinated vulnerability disclosure for open source projects. Basically, here's for people who are not familiar with, with how those things have tended to be done. Here's a white paper that describes the steps you can take when somebody notices a really bad bug in your code, one that's likely to put your users at substantial risk. Um, if it's revealed publicly before you've had a chance to try to get the major users out there updated or or do some other prep work. So uh, so that's that's an output from them, but they're also looking at how might we modernize the, the, the way that vulnerabilities are um, described out there in the open source world. And so there's a schema that's been developed for something called OSV, which really looks at that. Um, we also think it's uh, one of the important things to do is to, to really try to identify which open source projects are least well funded that are most potentially at risk. Um, and so there's a working group called uh, the um, Identifying Security Threats Working Group, which is, uh, uh, sorry, Securing Critical Projects Working Group, which is focused on looking at, they've developed a criticality score to try to measure for a given component, how many other components depend upon them. Uh, and, and, and in a recursive way so that something might be buried down deep, you know, three levels down uh, and ends up being used in 100 million different places has a better score than something, you know, that that is perhaps more important, but not as widely used. Right. And in fact, we funded work with Harvard that has resulted in a couple of reports, something called the, the, the Harvard Census on open source, which has published top lists. Uh, here's the top 50 in this category, top 50 in that category of components uh, at most uh, who, uh, who are considered the most critical. And that's data that we can use to try to figure out how do we, uh, if we're going to fund some improvements, some, fund some remediations, fund some third party audits, where, where what are the best projects to focus that on? All right, so real data driven approach to that. Um, we have other working groups on security tooling that are focusing on more automated tools to, to help developers make their code more secure. Um, another on identifying security threats, which is about trying to pull different uh, metrics together into a dashboard, as well as uh, pull all the third party audits that are done on open source code together into one place. Uh, we have a supply chain integrity working group that's focused on a specification called Salsa. And Salsa is really focused on layer uh, a framework for attestations about uh, the diligence that's been performed at each step of the software development uh, process and as code moves through a supply chain. Um, uh, and then we have some interesting side projects, associated projects, uh, such as Project Alpha Omega that is, um, has made some grants recently to uh, major foundations like Eclipse and the Python Foundation and the Node.js Foundation to help help them staff up a security team and help pay for some adoption of some different practices. Uh, and Apache has a great security team already uh, uh, and, and one that is kind of a model for, for others. Uh, but we think we think actually resourcing some of these teams helps them prove to them the value of that that then hopefully can be supplanted next year, you know, after the grant runs out with contributions from their own community. 
There's another project, uh, associated project called SigStore, which I mentioned, which is all about signatures on software artifacts as they flow through the supply chain. Uh, and another one that is focused on supporting the GNU tool chain and uh, community. Um, and then finally, I, I, we, we have a lot of connections in with the people who are at the product level and security level uh, at many of the major uh, software repositories, uh, NPM, PyPy, Maven Central. These uh, communities are distributing a whole lot of code. In essence, they are the uh, app stores for open source. And you know the commercial app stores, Apple App Store, Google App Store for Android, you know, Play Store, I guess, um, put a tremendous amount of effort into uh, security, into trying to make sure they're not a distribution point for things that could be fraudulent, things that could be um, uh, mistaken for other legitimate uh, applications, for example. And they can be a key point, leverage point for being able to improve the overall security of open source. And so we've got a working group that's focusing really on 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 what are some some practices initially, but then maybe there's some software, some tooling that would help harmonize and some standards that might harmonize everybody's efforts in that domain. Um, so all of these efforts are, are um, actually before I get to that, these are all best efforts, right? These are all ideas. Some of them turned into tooling, some of them turned into dashboards and websites. Um, we've seen a lot of adoption in the cloud native community of many of these uh, technologies. Many of them come from folks who've been very active in, in cloud native. Um, we are doing a lot to try to encourage adoption of them out there by, by other communities. but. You know, there was kind of a gauntlet thrown down um, uh, at last December uh, in the wake of log for shell, um, which, uh, by the way, a lot of people call it the log for J bug. And I kind of hate that term because it makes it sound like the team members are at fault and it really they weren't. Um, it was a group of people who did their best in a very challenging circumstance, a very challenging environment. So it's important that we call it log for shell as the compromise, not log for J. Um, anyways, this compromise got a lot of people very concerned. People in um, not just you know business and obviously the open source community, but also in government. And so we had uh, outreach. We received some outreach from the U.S. government, and particularly the White House, in particular the National Security Council, which doesn't often talk to open source communities uh, about uh, a, a meeting they wanted to hold in the wake of Log for Shell to understand what's going on. Right? You know, is this something that is expected? Is this the way open source is supposed to work? Uh, or is there something wrong that some resources could help address? Right? Um, actually, it was very constructive. They invited the Linux Foundation slash OpenSSF. They also invited the Apache Software Foundation um, and a whole bunch of companies as well. The larger companies, not 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 uh, well, not not always enough, but um, I, but we got together and talked for six hours about about these challenges and about what would it take to actually solve these issues um, and in response to that meeting the open ssf community developed a plan that basically tried to answer you know this question of you know what are the major weaknesses still out there and what would it take to if you had enough resources to close those weaknesses right to really make a, a substantial impact and keep them from coming back um, and and so we developed a series of three to five page uh, basically vision statements answering the following questions right within within the the goals of of that meeting uh and of the of, of closing up uh security issues what are the major problems to address that could lead to better open source software supply chain security what are some pre-existing efforts whether inside of open ssf or not that are already addressing those problems and then building on these pre-existing efforts what financial and other resources would it take to mostly or fully tackle each problem and then finally, what are some pragmatic but ambitious targets we can set for solutions to each problem with measurable results within the first two years? So the result of this was a document uh, called the Open Source Software Security Mobilization Plan. You can find it on the, the OpenSSF website. It is still version 0.9.1 because we expect uh, to evolve it over the next few months uh, with improvements and the like. But it was developed by the OpenSSF community and it outlines about $150 million in funding that could be uh, directed to 10 different streams, um, many of them building on OpenSSF, but some of them on, on new things as well, to go and, and try to really lock down how the open source community works. I won't go into detail on those 10. You're welcome to go read them. They cover a pretty wide baseline from better education to better risk assessment to more use of digital signatures um, to replacement of non-memory safe languages. Uh, to open source security, to an to a to a um, incident response team that could be available to open source projects, 
especially those that don't have the benefit of being a part of an Apache or, or Python or, or Linux Foundation. Um, we also believe it's really important to uh, accelerate the d discovery and remediation of new vulnerabilities. Um, we believe it's also important to spend money on third party audits and code reviews of lots and lots of open source projects. Um, you know, imagine what an, a third party code review of log4j might have overturned, um, for example. Um, we think it's also important to do, get to some better data sharing to, to by private companies uh, uh, to really figure out what are the most critical projects out there. Uh, we believe it's important to drive software bill of materials and as widely as we can, SBOMs as they're called. Uh, if you don't know much about SBOMs, happy to talk more about that at some point. Um, but they're basically an ingredients list for open source code um, and all software really. And then finally to work with the, with the build systems and package managers and distribution systems to, to better secure what they're doing. All of this is what led us to the $150 million number. And um, uh, sorry about the formatting here. Ah, there we go. Um, and in that, uh, uh, and so we had an event where we released the, uh, the, the plan. We worked with many of our partners. We've collected $30 million in initial pledges against that plan. And so as it evolves and, and as we get to specifics, we will see that money start to be issued. And $150 million might seem like a lot of money, uh, uh, you know, to, to an open source project. Um, I want to uh, be clear, the, there's another number out there that had been on my mind as we've been developing this plan, which was 700 million. And if anyone, that number is probably not immediately familiar, but $700 million was the amount um, that the Federal Trade Commission in the United States levied on Equifax, the credit bureau company in the United States, for the 2017 data breach caused in part by an unpatched uh, copy of Apache Struts. So dollar wise, you know, the amount of money we could save by investing collectively into this, um, I think would have a huge positive impact on the rest of the world. I want to end this with a little bit of a call uh, out to all of you uh, uh, and, a, and a bit of a nudge. Um, what can Op uh, Apache projects do to be more secure? What are the things that we've come up with? Um, I'll walk through them quickly. Again, I'm always very happy to talk more about it offline, but fill out the open SSF best practices badge take the secure uh, for your project, right? Take the securing software development courses, uh, require multi-factor authentication uh, for your, at least for your maintainers, for your core contributors. Um, update your dependencies. I mean, that's, you know, so many dependencies out there have uh, uh, certain warnings in them. And uh, I think you should set your minimum dependency version number to be the version ahead of any version that has a security warning in it. Uh, basically forcing your users to update a bit more than they might otherwise. Um, you should use the scorecards work that is to, that is uh, in the best practices working group and and see how well your your project does. You should consider deploying SigStore. I know there's been a ton of conversations within the Apache software community about about SigStore, uh, and I think it's maturing very quickly and and getting to a really good point. And then finally, you should adopt the guide to coordinated vulnerability disclosures. Uh, and, and look at publishing some SBOMs uh, and consuming those from upstream. These two actions uh, will lead to, to, to better security for your end users, for sure. Uh, and then finally, please feel free to join the OpenSSF working groups. We actually are launching a, um, a, a, a China community uh, special interest group that uh, will be kind of parked under our best practices working group that will be focusing not just on translations um, and, and getting more of the China community kind of involved in open SSF efforts, but growing the footprint out there for uh, the more developers, more users. We have within the open SSF members in China, such as Huawei and Tencent and uh, Alibaba Cloud and, and others, would love to see more, um, really eager to, to, to partner with many of you. We also have partnered with CAICT to try to get more government uh, visibility into uh, uh, the, uh, the work that we're doing and, and the importance of focusing on the software supply chain. And that's all paying off. Um, we, we have a, an open SSF uh, uh, WeChat channel as well that we'd love to have you all join. And with that, um, all I can say is thank you all so much. I've really appreciated talking with all of you uh, and, um, and really eager to learn more about what you all think we could be doing to help you make Apache software projects more secure. Um, and with that, I'll say bid you adieu and uh, thank you. See you soon.